Hi, room 15. This is chapter 21, The Toy Tinker. We left the Boniface estate on the 1st of May, and Nicodemus, said Nicodemus, we knew a lot more than we went in, when we went in. We had been there for eight months. Then, said Justin, we found the toy tinker. They were back in Nicodemus's office. Mr. Ages, having rested, sat with them. Not quite yet, said Mr. Ages. No, said Nicodemus. That was late summer. When we first got out, we began searching for a place to live permanently, or at least a place where we could stay as long as we wanted to. We had a pretty clear idea of what we were looking for. We had had plenty of time to talk about it on the long winter evenings in the library between reading books. The reading we did, we knew very little about the world, you see, and we were curious. We learned about astronomy, about electricity, biology, and mathematics, music, art. I even read quite a few books of poetry and got to like it pretty well. But what I liked best was history. I read about the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans, and the Dark Ages, when the old civilizations fell apart and the only people who could read and write were the monks. They lived apart in monasteries. They led the simplest kind of lives and studied and wrote. They grew their own food, built their own houses and furniture. They even made their own tools and their own paper. Reading about that, I began getting some ideas of how we might live. Most of the books were about people. We tried to find some about rats, but there really wasn't much. We did find a few things. There were two sets of encyclopedias that had sections on rats. From what we had learned about what, I'm sorry, from them we had, we learned that we were about the most hated animals on earth, except for maybe snakes and germs. That seemed strange to us and unjust, especially when we learned that some of our close cousins, squirrels for instance, and rabbits, were well liked. But people think we spread disease, and I suppose possibly we do, though never intentionally, of course. And surely we never spread as many diseases as people themselves do. Still, it seemed to us that the main reason we were hated must be that we always lived by stealing. From the earliest times, rats lived around the edges of human cities and farms, stowed away on men's ships, gnawed holes in their floors, and stole their food. Sometimes we were accused of biting human children. I didn't believe that, nor did any of us, unless it was some kind of subnormal rat, bred in the worst of city slums. And that, of course, can happen to people, too. Had we then no use at all in the world? One encyclopedia had a sentence of praise for us. The common rat is highly valued as an experimental animal in medical research due to its high toughness, intelligence, versatility, and biological similarity to man. We knew quite a bit about that already. But there was one book written by a famous scientist that, read, that had a chapter about rats. Millions of years ago, he said, rats seemed to be ahead of all the other animals, seemed to be making a civilization of their own. They were well organized and quite and built quite complicated villages in the fields. Their descendants today are the rats known as prairie dogs. But somehow it didn't work out. The scientists thought maybe it was because the rats' lives were too easy, while the other animals, especially the monkeys, were living in the woods and getting tougher and smarter. The prairie dogs grew soft and lazy and made no more progress. Eventually the monkeys came out of the woods, walking on their hind legs, and took over the prairies and almost everything else. It was then that the rats were driven to become scavengers and thieves, living on the fringes of the world, run by men. Still, it was an interesting to us that for a while at least the rats had been ahead. We wondered, if they had stayed ahead, if they had gone and developed a real civilization, what would it have been like? Would rats too have shed their tails and learned to walk? Would they have made tools? Probably, though we thought not so soon and not so many. A rat has a natural set of tools monkeys lack sharp pointed teeth that never stop growing. Consider what the beavers can build with no tools with their rodent teeth. Surely rats have, would have developed reading and writing, judging by the way we took to it. But what about machines? What about cars and airplanes? Maybe not airplanes. After all, monkeys living in trees must have felt a need to fly, must have envied the birds around them. Rats may not have that instinct. In the same way, a rat civilization would probably never have built skyscrapers, since rat pref rats prefer to live underground. But think of the endless, endless subways, below subways, below subways they would have had. We thought and talked quite a lot about this, and we realized that a rat civilization, if one ever did grow up, would not necessarily turn out to be anything at all like human civilization. The fact was, after eight months in the Boniface estate, none of us was sorry to move out of it. It had given us shelter, free food, and an education, but we were never really comfortable there. Everything in it was designed for animals who looked, moved, and thought differently from the way that we did. Also, it was above ground, and that never felt quite natural to us. So when we left, we decided that our new home should be underground, preferably. If we could find it, a cave? But where? We had thought hard. 
and studied maps and atlases. There were plenty of those in the study. Finally, we reached some conclusions. To find a cave, we must have to go where there are mountains. There aren't many caves in flatlands. And for food, it would have to be near a town or better, a farm. So we wanted to find a farm, preferably a big one, with a big barn and silos full of grain near the mountains. We studied the map some more and it was Jenner, I think, who spotted this area as a good place to look. On the map, a big part of it was covered with the contour lines that show mountains, and across these were written the words, Thorn Mountains National Park. Beneath that, in small letters, it said, Protected Wilderness Preserve. Bordering this, where the mountains turned to foothills, the map showed rolling country, oops, rolling country with quite a few roads, but hardly any towns, which we thought ought to mean farmland. We were right, as of course you know now. It took us two months of steady traveling to get to the Thorn Mountains National Forest, but we found it. We're under the edge of it right now. And there are plenty of caves, most of them never visited by people, because people aren't allowed to drive into a wilderness preserve. There aren't any roads in the forest, but only a few jeep trails used by rangers, and airplanes are not permitted to fly over it. We looked a lot at, at a lot of the caves, some big, some small, some dry, but mostly damp. Before we chose this cave and this farm, however, we found the toy tinker. It began as a sad sort of thing. We found an old man lying in the woods one morning near one of the jeep trails not far from here, and he was dead. We don't know what he died of. We guessed it must have been a heart attack. He was dressed in a black suit, old-fashioned in style but neat, not ragged. His hair was right and his, his hair was white, and his face looked gentle. I wonder who he was and where he was going, Jen Justin said. Whoever he was, Jenner said, he wasn't supposed to be here at all. We ought to bury him, I said. So we did not by digging a grave, but by covering him with a high mountain of leaves and stones and twigs and earth. It was a gathering it was in gathering material for this mound that Justin made the second discovery. He was back in the bushes out of our sight. Look here, he called. I found a truck. It was a very ancient truck with a small round hood and it had been lovingly polished and was wonderfully shiny. The body, which was square and large, had been rebuilt and painted red and gold. It had a little windows with white curtains between them. Lettered in gold signs were says right here the toy tinker toys repairs hobby kits model sets electric toys all work guaranteed obviously the truck had belonged to an old man he was a peddler and mender of toys and the red and gold wagon was his shop and his home and he had driven into the woods to camp for the night it was against the law of course so he had concealed the truck behind some bushes off the trail under a big beech tree we could see where he had made a campfire, carefully surrounding it with stones and clearing away the brush so that he would not set the woods afire. Beyond the beech tree, a brook followed. It was a peaceful spot. We could see what had probably caused the man's death. One wheel of the truck had sunk into the soft earth and was stuck. A shovel lay near it. He had been trying to dig it out. The shovel, uh, I already read that. The work had been too hard for him and he started to go for help when he collapsed. This much we could figure out just by looking. Then somebody said, Whose truck is it now? It belongs to his heirs, I said. Whoever they are, said Jenner. He may not even have any. He seems to be very alone. Anyway, said somebody else. How would they ever find it? That's true, I said. We don't know who he was, and if we did, we had have no way of notifying anyone. So I suppose if we want it, the truck is ours. Why don't we see what's in it? All right, that was chapter 21.